Hello and welcome back to Just a Book. I'm Sergio and I'm going to be reading through The Tunnel by Anthony Brown. Probably one of his most famous books, this one. It can be targeted at any age group. It usually comes in around seven, eight, so you're three in England. But your four, five and six have a greater benefit for understanding the many subtexts that Anthony is so famous for weaving through simple stories and images. So we'll start. We have the title page, one I'm particularly excited about because there is a parallel to a very famous portrait of Bach, the composer. In that portrait, we have Bach looking at the audience and he's got, I think with his backhand, he's got a note and it's got notation on it, musical notes. I think it's about six or seven notes and it's a riddle. You need to decipher it. And what it ends up being Actually, I won't ruin that for you, but you can research that. Just type in Bach's port portrait um, mystery. That should get it. But it is very similar to this picture here. You have a girl's legs going into a tunnel, and then you have a book which is open, and this offers a sort of a clue to the story or to what can happen. Children love, love having guesses, predicting what could possibly happen. So it's a nice image to grab students attention what could be happening throughout this book you'll also be seeing very f vibrant colors lots of reds greens blues and more particularly in this book than i've seen in many of these other ones which is also quite well because it uses uh, it's been used i think to grab students attention let's go once upon a time there lived a sister and brother who were not at all alike in every way, they were different. The sister stayed inside on her own, reading and dreaming. The brother played outside with his friends, laughing and shouting, throwing and kicking, roughing and tumbling. We have an image here where students will be completely familiar with. If they have sibling, siblings, they will know about all these different quarrels, all these different strange dynamics that they get involved in. My siblings, personally, I used to fight with them quite a lot. So this would be like, oh, this is a story that I, I can make links to my life. That's a nice little hook to get this book as a real interest in the student's own um, understanding. We have two solid images. You have the, the bricks for the boy. There's lots of gender stereotyping here, which is a great, great thing to bring up during Philosophy for Children or PSHE. But you have the boy, he's got the, the bricks at the back, logical, structured, also can complement work which men are quite familiar, uh, you can associate men with, like brickwork, labour. Then you have the girl who's been plastered against this floral, delicate, organic, nature kind of scene. She's got a smile, they both have smiles, so it's very lovely. Usually when you take family photos, you, everyone's smiling, everyone's happy, but you, before that moment, it's like, no, I'm standing here, no, I'm standing here. So a lot of children will be able to relate to this, this scene. I would ask children here, why did you think the author chose this background for these, for these kids? We have here again, uh, actually, yeah, we have here again, the girl sitting high atop a windowsill, looking down, and the boy is on the ground, doing practical, physical things. I think there's a real relationship here between the imagination, which is where the girl is sitting. She's reading stories, dreaming, which is usually associated with the mind, the psychology. And then you have the boy who's running, laughing, kicking, which is all about the body, movement, the physical. Again, we have softer uh, colors with the girl, and we have sort of a limited amount of palette, we can say, with the boy. Interestingly, the boy is wearing a nice, colourful shirt. But yeah, I think something about that, the levels at which they are doing their activity, says something about the mindset, the way they embody themselves within this world. Nice little um, collection of, of clauses here, or phrases. Reading and dreaming. The brother played outside with his friends, laughing and shouting, throwing and kicking, roughing and tumbling. Children would be, well, why are they, why, why are you doing ands? You've taught us 
to just do commas and the last word, the last, sorry, noun, you need to put an and before that. It's a nice little entry point into how you can play around with language once you learn to master it. So lots of children can, can start to get a glimpse of, oh, okay, if I use these two verbs together, these two, there's a similarity between them, I can put a conjunction between them. So it's a nice little example here. All right. At night, he slept soundly in his room, but she would lie awake listening to the noises of the night. Sometimes he crept into her room to frighten her, for he knew that she was afraid of the dark. Again, a very, very similar story that lots of children would would um, associate themselves with. My brother used to scare me, my sister did as well. I'm the youngest, unfortunately, so I got a lot of that, a lot of that attention. Here he is, dreaming, happy as ever, goes to sleep, no problem. In fact, he's got enough time, he's got enough worry, a uh, little worry, that he can go into his sister's room and upset her, scare her. Here she is, lying awake, we assume, looking up, or struggling to fall asleep. She has her nightlight, which is the home. Of course, with Anthony Brown, there are lots of clues, lots and lots of clues that uh, secretly, sometimes more obviously, but secretly lay within the picture. So let's try and find some of those clues now. We have Little Red Riding Hood's uh, hood, cloak, coat, cloak, coat over here. Children would say, oh, that's a story from, mm. We have a cupboard, which has kind of this nose thing or this white sheet is coming out. Could it be a ghost? We actually have the story of the Little Red Riding Hood. It gives an idea of what would happen if this is in the book? What is the meaning behind this? Why would Anthony Brown put this image here? Why not Cinderella? Why not Aladdin? Something like that. But he's chosen Little Red Riding Hood. That could be for the future. And that could help children's predictions. You have here what I, I thought this would be the gingerbread house. That's what I thought. But it probably is actually, now that I think about it more clearly, the house in which the grandmother is sleeping or is staying, where Red Riding Hood goes and visits. So that little grandmother's house is a place of, is a happy memory, a safe memory for, for the girl, the child. She sits with a teddy bear, so did I, until I was about 10 or 11. There's a kind of like a little mouse, I mean it's a clicker for the light, but it's decorated as a little animal, which Anthony Brown is very fond of doing. And of course we have the brother here with his mask, and the wolf, a shadow of a wolf, is, is plastered against the ground. So we have a, a, a secret story, not so secret, we have a story painted in this picture of what is going to come. Again, we have, I'm going to go back a page, uh, lots of opportunities for um, adverbs. Soundly, and we'll see some coming up, coming up. Whenever they were together, they fought and argued noisily all the time. Again, we have this short sentence for impact all the time. It's trying to get your attention that you need to stop and think about this phrase. And, and there it is. We have this hand, this menacing hand. So I'm aware that my screen is flashing. I don't know why if I did this without help. No. Hmm. We have this hand, which is pointing, quite domineering. And this hand carries across. You can actually see them in the screen. Carries across from the mother. And it's this foreboding presence of power. Like, you need to be doing this. You should be doing this. And the sister gets that from both parties, it looks like. The sister's obviously upset. She has a flower in front of her. Her her jumper is, again, floral, pink, quite stereotypical. One morning, their mother grew impatient with them. Out you go together, she said, and try to be nice to each other just for once, and be back in time for lunch. But the boy didn't want his little sister with him. So there we have that doom and gloom kind of feeling that they have to go out. They take their objects of safety. He takes the ball. She takes the book, which allows her to enter into an imaginative world separate from her actual resistance, her existence. You can see here, very nice little three, that's quite typical, um, glass stuck on top of the wall. 
to sign of things to come. This is a dangerous place. It's the it's not a rich area. You wouldn't have it's like a low maintenance kind of it's effective, but a low maintenance type of security. And the children are going into that world. They went to a piece of waste ground. Why do they have to come? Or why do you have to come? He moaned. It's not my fault, she said. I didn't want to come to this awful place. It scares me. Oh, you baby, said her brother. You're frightened of everything. He went off to explore. Of course he's going to go off and explore. He's a boy. Or is that stereotypical? Nice little passage here of text, of dialogue. Um, new speaker, new line comes in here. Lovely example. I would get this and I would put it all as a paragraph and say, well, what's wrong with this paragraph? How can we fix it? Can they continue the conversation? This is also another activity. Here we have a picture, uh, this image, and we'll see in the next uh, coming up, but we'll see he wants your eye to try and find, recognize objects and shapes, particularly faces. Here we can see this eye, and then we have, could be another kind of eye with a kind of like screaming mouth. That might be a bit of a long shot, but definitely is there. A little mask over here. There's a face over here, a foot. I mean, there would be so many more. Um, but this really strange, raggedy environment that they are in. Children can then guess what kind of area they live in. Are they rich? Why? Why not? They can use clues from the page before. But it's a junkyard. It's a, a place of chaos. Hey, come here, he yelled a little while later. She walked over to him. Look, he said, a tunnel. Come on, let's see what that, what's at the other end. N no, you mustn't, she said. There must be witches or goblins or anything down there. Don't be so wet, said her brother. That's kid stuff. We have to be back by lunchtime, she said. So again, we have a nice example of um, dialogue happening here. Sorry. Um, happening here. This word wet, that could be, what, what does this word mean in context of the line? So they can get a dictionary, they know what the word wet is, but what does he mean by this? What is he trying to say? Again, we can talk about the italics, if you want to talk about font and computers, stories and computers. In any case, they discover the tunnel, and a lot of children would recognise this picture as being close to the title page. He leaves his ball behind, and he goes in. Her mind is filled with the imagination, and, and she's wondering, witches, goblins, dragons. Of course she would think that. That's the, the place that she puts her, her mind as. Anything that is frightening or unfamiliar will be filled with the material that she feeds herself. Her sister was frightened of the tunnel, and so she waited for him to come out again. She waited and waited, but he did not come. She was close to tears. What could she do? She had to follow him into the tunnel. So she sits there, as many of us, I'm sure, have sat there and waited for something. She's having a moral conundrum, a moral dilemma. And this is why it kind of appeals to students of this age. They find themselves in a world which tells them to do certain things, yet their feelings are telling them to do something else. So at this point of the book, especially the child, or both children, but especially the girl, starts to understand that there's two different voices, two different directions, any, or minimum two, any decision can be made. She's listening to her own morals, and she's also listening to the morals of the world around her. What should she do? She loves her brother, but she's not meant to go off by herself, exploring, etc. She makes the decision, as the next page tells us. She goes into this tunnel. This is the page uh, at the front of the book. And she leaves behind... I think, I think this is very symbolic. She leaves behind uh, her book, uh, which is knighting someone. I don't know. I don't think that's... Well, it could be important, but I don't think it's too important. And she's leaving behind what I think is the imagination that she uh, accesses in books. 
And I think here, she's going into her imagination. She's actually physically going into her imagination. And the world that she comes out on next is going to be, we'll see, filled with all her fears. So this is a symbolic moment, not of leaving the story behind, but leaving this fantasy, the imagination captured in a book and actually going into it. She's facing that fear, not facing the fear. She's, she's going into the fear and it comes out of this stronger force of love and sibling um, connection that seems to be a stronger value at this moment. Also probably because she's afraid of what her mum might say, etc. But her love for her brother trumps her fear of the unknown. She now faces her, her dilemma. The tunnel was dark and damp and slimy and scary. If the author listed, the tunnel was dark, damp, slimy and scary, each adverb, adjective, wouldn't really have that impact. He wants you to stop at every adjective. The tunnel was dark and damp and slimy and scary. Yeah, so she crawls in. At the other end, she found herself in quiet, in a quiet wood. There was no sign of her brother, but the wood soon turned into a dark forest. She thought about wolves and giants and witches and wanted to turn back, but she could not. For what would become of her brother if she did? By now, she was very frightened and she began to run faster and faster. Eclipses for that, that suspense. So nice and peaceful, this wood. Oh, it's not so bad. We have the girl walking around, birds chirping, eating things off the ground. But of course, soon becomes a darker forest. And before I go to the next page, we have giants and witches and wolves and one to turn back. And this is the moment which solidifies that thought for what would become of her brother if she did run back. That is the moral conundrum right there. She wants to go back, but she loves her brother. These are the hard decisions to make. Now she really enters her imagination. Lots of things come alive into the into into her into the world around her. And we know that at night time as children when we sleep, we see shadows cast against the wall, and for a moment they look like something sinister. But when we get a good look at it, we just can see oh it's a shadow coming from the plant, from the tree. So the illustrations in this book, in this page, and the next ones to come, really allow themselves to be looked at twice, three times. Oh, I thought I thought I saw a face. I thought I saw a hand. I thought I saw something dangerous. And then when you see it closely, it's a spark. It's just the shape of a tree. So let's have a look at some of the, the scary things that are coming out of here. I mean, this is a terrifying face. Goodness gracious, from far away. We have weapons. A club. We have things that can look like body parts, beast parts. This hole in the tree is not a hole that something goes and lives in. It's being actually boarded off. Something dangerous. Don't come in. Don't come out. That would be even more scary. We have the typical uh, stump with the or the uh, the um, typical the familiar stump with the axe of the woodcutter. Little Red Riding Hood. She's wearing the red hood. A lot of activities happening over here. Shapes, sizes, colours. A sleeping leopard or a, a snake or a yeah, leopard. Something reptilian. Hoofs. Claws. A thumb. <laughs> um, a rope. Spider web. Children could spend ages, absolute ages, just looking at this picture writing some very interesting language about it, but also just in, in, in astonishment and how brilliant it is, how much is going on. We have this tree in the back, which is actually the only tree which is kind of, which is green. There's like some promise. Parts of her her safety are, are still are still there. Something non threatening, perhaps. We have a forest. A forest. A fire in the back. Again, this it's like beavers and I could just every time we look at it, there's something new. 
lovely, absolutely lovely page this. I just think, well done, well done. The blur of the girl, first and foremost, is just something I don't think many children have seen in their in their lives. It's obviously it's, it it suggests speed, but children, I think this is first signs of animation. This is the first signs of of TV in that you know moving pictures. That's where the ideas come from. So that picture, she's running through this terrifying forest. It's just brilliant. I think it's very well done. Let's see why she's running. Looks like leopard skin from afar. Then we have this bear, actually. There's its head. There's the body. These are like the three bears. It's got a coat on. Its arms are out, you know, ready to attack. Big, trumpy, treed legs. We have a, a boar's head over here again this, this could be i can turn my head this could be a, an animal sleeping with its mouth open the branches are all entwined tangled there we have something demonic perhaps it's something from the grave of course there's a grave that's what happens in in dark scary forests then we have the wolf itself the tree has turned into this wolf let me move this over here and the wolf got a, has a cane or a walking stick and is so close to Little Red Riding Hood or the little sister. Or is it just a tree? We don't know. But these are the, there's its paw, a paw, and there's a house in the back. Could that be grandmother's cottage? Um, so yeah, beautiful illustration of all the fears and all the things that she's read upon has filled her mind. Just when she knew she could run no further, she came to a clearing. There was a figure, still as stone. It was her brother. Oh no, she sobbed. I'm too late. This is a really fascinating picture. Children will spend a long time, if you let them, oops, a long time wondering, how did he get frozen? What's he frightened of? And there is no answer. Anthony Brown does not give us a reason why he's frozen solid. We can get clues. We can infer in his face that he faced terror. That he was frightened. Frightened to stone. Yeah. The forest ahead of him is all cut down. This boy certainly has been mortified. Petrified. And she's sobbing. She's too late. So although she quabbles with her sibling a lot, when there's actually something that has happened, which is quite fatal, tears come out of her eyes. This is the magic moment. She threw her arms around the cold, hard form and wept. Very slowly, the figure began to change colour, becoming softer and warmer. Then, little by little, it began to move. Her brother was there. Rose, I knew you'd come, he said. They ran back through the forest, through the wood, into the tunnel, and out again, together. The first line, the first time here, one single word which outweighs all the other words, all those other little short sentences. Um, they were always fighting. It never ended. Things like that. This one is finally a word of unity. They've come together in this moment. Let's go back to the first picture. The boy is frightened and it's because of her love. Her tears, her sadness, it penetrates her love, penetrates the hard exterior that the boy has, has been mummified in. And because of that, because of her persistence and her love, the boy softens and they become friends again. They become loving, loving siblings. What could be happening here? Children would, again, have many, many different ideas. I like to talk about uh, that saying, when your eyes are red, your heart is blue, which means if you're angry and a bully, that's the context, but if you're angry, then usually your heart is blue. You're feeling sad inside. The boy in this book, like any boy, is quite to their sibling. Most boys are the bullies. But usually behind that exterior, there is a type of pain or there is a type of fear. And that fear, that pain, that blue, the only thing that can really talk to that is 
compassion. So you don't fight red eyes, you don't fight anger with anger, you fight anger with water. That's the metaphors I'm using. And here she is, she's penetrating through that stone exterior with her compassion, her water as well, her tears, and it goes through and it 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 absolves the bully and releases the loving sibling. When they reached home, their mother was sitting at the table. Hello, she said. You two seem very quiet. Is everything all right? Rose smiled at her brother, and Jack smiled back. Nice little point here to say is that uh, children at this age, from six upwards, will start to understand that they have very different relationships with different people, not in their friendship, not just in their friendship groups, but in their family as well. The relationship between her and her brother becomes a kind of a secret, becomes kind of a, um, this is, I read this in a review, a secret garden, that's right, of feelings. She will have a different relationship with her father, with her mother, and those sorts of related relationships will create a more complex way of understanding the world. So this is a, another example of the different storylines that children create at this age and can create. They don't tell her mother. It's a, it's a secret from her. And they share that, they share that um, experience together quietly. And that's what creates the bond. Lovely book. Really recommend this one. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. Again, you can go to all those images and just, oh, you can get so much out of this. Um, really recommend it. So, yeah. Hope you enjoyed. Just a book. Have a good day.